What's up, everybody? Welcome to Political Fight Club. And this isn't a, uh, really a political episode. This is a book review episode. I occasionally do these. Um, whenever I read something interesting, if it's worth doing a review of, I will try to do a short episode on it. And I just finished this today. Um, you may have heard of it before. It's called Propaganda by Edward Bernays. Um, if you recognize the name, it's because he was Sigmund Freud's nephew. And uh, he's basically like the godfather of propaganda. He, during World War I, was part of a committee called the Committee of Public Information, which is basically the propaganda arm of the U.S. government that was responsible for selling World War I to the public. Um, and if you've ever heard the phrase, we're making the world safe for democracy, that's Edward Bernays. He, he coined that during the propaganda campaign for World War I. The book itself doesn't really go over that at all, um, not the CPI nor uh, World War I propaganda. It mostly is just kind of a manual on you know how a skilled propagandist is supposed to operate. And then there's some ethical things that he goes over, and he was pretty ethical in terms of the way he thought propaganda should be used. Um, but he admits, like it, you know, it's going to be used to improper ends. So, and it does have kind of a stigma to it the the word itself it's kind of taboo like he spent the second half of his life after world war one was done um doing propaganda for various corporate interests and the u.s government a little bit um but a lot of the time he was tr out you know debating and doing lectures on why propaganda is a four-letter word and why it shouldn't be because it can be used you know when used properly it can be used to moral ends but it's one of those things, you know, it's it's a tool that is so easy to be used by evil people, by, you know, corporatists and sociopaths to evil ends than it is to be used to good ends. So it's like, yeah, I, I agree that propaganda can be used for good, but it very rarely is. It's difficult to be used for good. But that doesn't mean we should stop trying to use it for good because, you know, <laughs> in, a, in an era of fake news... Um, the truth is going to need a like PR team because and, and especially with how we are so addicted to like entertainment in this country and how short attention spans we have the truth needs to be like more glamorous otherwise people aren't going to pay attention to it in this country so we we're going to need to utilize propaganda for the truth I used to think that truth was uh Truth didn't need a, a PR squad, but in America, truth needs a PR squad, so um, we're going to need to utilize some of these tactics as well. Um, the main thing I'd like to go over that he um, delineates in the, in the book, which I thought was fascinating, is that the best propagandists really have to do two things well. They have to keep their finger on the pulse of America or of their country or their, um, their target demographic that they're trying to sell to, and they have to understand what those people truly want in their um, deepest, darkest fantasies, what they actually will spend money on and time and effort on and pay attention to. Um, and you have to know what people really want, not just what they say they want, but what they're willing to actually spend money on and time on. And then the other thing, and you have to be just as good at this, is doing your best to craft what people actually want. And you have to be good at both. So, like, the way that he puts it is, like, you know, for instance, cars. Um, very few people are pragmatic nowadays in the way that they purchase a car. They don't go out and necessarily get something that works for their comfort or for durability purposes or reliability or something that's easy to fix or even something that necessarily grabs them aesthetically kind of naturally, like that looks cool. What a lot of people will do when they buy something like a car is they will go, it'll be something like a status thing, like where they'll uh, say, oh, the guy down the street got a BMW, so I should probably get a nicer BMW. Or they may be seen an advertisement of a certain automobile where the man driving it is a good-looking guy, and he's cruising along the coast, and he's got a, a model girlfriend sitting in the passenger seat, and she seems so happy and scantily clad. And so he goes, I kind of want that car because I want to be like that guy. So a lot of, a lot of the... Um, the reason or the reasoning we use to buy certain things or to think certain way is what uh, Bernays called cliches. So, and that's kind of, I've always thought that, like Americans in particular, they, they don't really form an opinion based on data or objective critical thought. It's mostly like advertising, propaganda, and subliminal messaging and, you know, stuff like that. 
you know, if you've ever seen the show Mad Men, you understand this kind of stuff a lot, like the way that these advertising campaigns go and the way that propaganda really operates in this country. So um, it's interesting. What they will do is they'll try to create these cliches and make you want certain products because you've either seen it in an ad or because you associate it with something that you love. Like some people will even buy a car simply because, you know, they saw one on the road that was the same color as their favorite like sports teams logo and they're like that car is kind of cool looking I kind of want to go get that car in that color and really what they want is just a car in that color but they go and get that car because they've associated that you know the car that they saw that they thought was pretty cool looking that had the colors of their favorite sports team on the road and that's enough for them rather than actually going hey what kind of car is that I wonder if it's actually a, you know a good automobile I wonder if it would actually service me the way I need a lot of it is vanity um, so that's America for you, and um, it goes into some detail on how uh, clever propagandists throughout history have gone about um, creating these cliches and creating public opinion based off of nothing more than good public relations and propaganda. For instance, he talks about, like, he actually more or less created... Um, the idea that you need to have a balanced breakfast because most Americans didn't used to eat breakfast back in the day but then Bernays was on uh, he was called by some of these corporations I imagine like Kellogg's and some of these other ones I don't want to say Kellogg's sp specifically but you know these companies that were early on proponents making cereal and milk and bacon and eggs and the American style breakfast you know all that had to happen you think that those those things all came together like naturally like we just we studied it all in a in a, a scientific lab and we've decided that breakfast should be you know hearty and have eggs and bacon and all these other things no 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 the they were corporations that stand to make a lot of money that you know made bacon or cereal or even milk and they go to somebody like Bernays who goes oh well we're just gonna you know wrangle up some doctors that'll agree with us that they'll say well it's good to eat a, another meal in the morning we're going to say that you have to have a hearty breakfast to be healthy. And regardless that bacon, eggs, milk, a lot of that stuff isn't that good for you. They didn't care. They just used the authority of those doctors and a skilled propagandist like Bernays to basically create the idea that you need to eat, eat breakfast, which you don't. I'm a doctor. You don't. Breakfast is not needed whatsoever. And in fact, it's probably bad to have breakfast compared to not because studies have shown that intermittent fasting is much healthier and two meals a day is better than three. So the fact that we have, you know, a, this cliche idea that you need to have a balanced breakfast to be a healthy person is complete propaganda. And they go through it in this book, how they did it. So it's like, that's the type of thing I'm saying. Like that's an ideology. It's something that people in America think is just like common knowledge and it's scientifically proven. But the fact is, is that it's all propaganda. It's all fake. It was, it was created, fabricated by somebody who was skillful enough to pull it off. And now that's like common sense in America when it's absolutely rubbish, but it did sell a lot of bacon, a lot of eggs, a lot of, you know, cornflakes. So it's crazy. Um, the last thing I'd like to talk about, uh, when referring to propaganda is I think that now that I'm really seeing the intricacies of how this stuff gets done, I'm really starting to see why Donald Trump did so well in 2016 and why he did so poorly in 2020, and also why Bernie Sanders um, has never been able to get over the hump. Because when it comes down to selling themselves and propaganda, Trump is an absolutely wonderful propagandist. No surprises there, he reads a lot of Hitler. But um, Bernie is, on the other hand, a fairly poor propagandist. He's a very honest man, and he says what he means, um, and he fights for all the right things. But the truth is, is that he's just not a very good, he's not very good at framing things. He's gotten some things framed correctly, like Medicare for All is a human right. That's framed correctly. But then there are other things that he doesn't do so well. Now, example, I, uh, I'd like to you know, point out a few things. Trump did very well in 2016 because he was the only one to realize that it is now fashionable to be running against the status quo. The days of the very well-mannered, very, um, you know, proper-sounding politician are over. Those days are over. And the only reason they don't, it's not obvious now is because there's still a whole bunch of old people in Congress and also in the presidency that 
are still talking like that, but within 20 years that's going to be gone. And Trump's the first one to realize that. And the proof is in the pudding. He talks off the cuff, and in all of the debates, he treated them more like entertainment because he's from reality TV, right? And what the American people want nowadays is they don't want to tune into a debate where somebody like, you know, Mitt Romney is debating Barack Obama anymore. They don't want somebody like Bill Clinton or any of these triangulation, very proper sounding Democrats or Republicans in there. They want someone that shoots from the hip and they want it more like a roast. I've been saying this for, since Trump won. This was, it was evidence to me that Trump's style of going up there and roasting everybody else works well. It does. And I, I wish that the American public wasn't tuning in for a roast when they go to check on the debates, but they are. And that's just the way it is. We're a very highly entertained population. That's just the way that it is. They don't want to see decorum. They want to see good one-liners, substantive answers, and mic dropping, unfortunately. And, and Trump did that very well against Hillary Clinton, and he did that very well in the Republican primaries in 2016. Um, and Hillary Clinton is extremely bad, too. She can't frame anything correctly. She got absolutely smoked um, in all the debates with Trump. He just, you know, when hammered on, uh, you know, NAFTA and TPP and all the stuff that, and, and how the Clintons were super corrupt and the Clinton Foundation and all that stuff. And that was, that rang true. That's, that's going after somebody in the same way that you would in a rap battle. You're going after them on substance, on things that they personally did, and then just drop the mic. It worked. Bernie's not good at this. He's too nice. And unfortunately, he still, he still seems like he's talking genuinely, so he, he does shoot from the hip, which does appeal to people. The problem with what he did versus what Trump did is that he miscalculated that the Democratic Party and the Democratic voters in particular are different somehow than the Republican voters in that they would not like it if he was aggressive up there. He didn't want to attack Joe Biden or Elizabeth Warren or really go after anybody hard because he thought he thinks that Democrats are on a moral high ground with Republican voters and they're just not. Everybody's tuning in for the same thing nowadays and I'm sorry to say it and you got to accept it. So here's what Bernie should have done and I said this back when it happened. There's two things in particular that he could have done that would have absolutely gotten him the uh, the presidency in my opinion. Um, first, he needed to call out Biden's senility. And I know what you're thinking, Rob, if he had called out Biden's senility, everybody would have hated him. Right. You're right. Framing is everything. What he needed to do, and I stated this on Facebook when it was happening, is say, listen, I'm concerned for you, Joe. Be on the debate stage and act concerned that he's not going to be able to take on Donald Trump. Act concerned that he's not going to be able to run the country. And then just point things out like, listen, I know you personally. I know what you sounded like back when you uh, debated um, Paul Ryan, uh, f what was that, four years ago? It was back when Obama was running, or so that would be eight years ago. And it's night and day. Like, Joe, you're slowing down. I'm concerned that you can't handle this. Frame it thusly, from concern, not aggression. Because what that does, and the propagandist would agree, is that it gets the same point across that Joe Biden is not mentally capable to be president, which he's not, by the way, but it doesn't get you the animosity that coming off as an aggressor gets. Ask Julian Castro. He was the only person who went after Joe Biden for his senility um, in the debates, and the, the moment was golden, but he got killed after that because he went after Joe in a way that didn't seem humane. It seemed like he was trying to be mean. And that does not resonate well. So you act, you know, if you can go after Joe Biden on his senility, but frame it from a you know perspective of you're concerned, because I would be concerned. They're friends. Bernie could have easily done this and gone, dude, you're not mentally capable to do this. You can't take on Donald Trump. This next eight months is going to be hell for you. And luckily for Joe, he got to sit in his basement for the next eight months because of uh, COVID, but that's neither here nor there. That's how I would have framed it. Second thing he could have done, and this would have landed hard, um, and this is because these things are things that the public does care about, by the way. Electability was the main thing that most people cited as the reason they voted for Joe over Trump. If you make the senility argument, that's one of those things that makes the electability argument go away real fast in most people's minds. Is like the last thing that we need is exchanging one 
guy with the brain of a child for another guy with the brain of a child or the brain of a senile old man. That would have rung true. It would have done very well. People care about that. Second thing that they would have cared about, and they always do on both sides of the aisle, is sexual harassment or rape. And the one thing that Bernie could have done was he could have called Joe Biden out for what he did to Tara Reid. Now, I know what you're thinking, Rob. You can't just go up there and call Joe Biden a rapist, you know? And I agree. Again, you have to frame it thusly. And here's how you do it. You just frame it pro-woman. I believe all women. And you call out all the centrist Democrats or Joe Biden in particular and people that are behind Joe Biden for being hypocrites on the Me Too movement. You just say, listen, um, I was, of course, part of the Me Too movement. I believe Tara Reid. I believe all of these women. It just seems to me that Joe over here is a little bit of a hypocrite if he believes all women except for Tara Reid. And use the name over and over again. And people do their own research and they'll realize that Joe Biden is really a misogynist. He's a racist. And you could have gone with something else on that as well. I'm sure you could have there's numerous things. Keep hammering on the crime bill, for instance. Um, but I, I think that if you had just gone with focused on the Tara Reid thing and his senility and framed them in a non-aggressive way like this, you could have actually defeated Joe Biden because those are things that do ring true in uh, people's psyches and they don't take a lot of explanation. Like you just, you know, <sighs> you remember when Trump um, was in so much trouble in 2016 when it came out, like I think it was the Stormy Daniels thing. And then he immediately, or no, 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 sorry. It was the, uh, the uh, grab him by the pussy thing. And uh, it looked like he was toast. And then what he did is he flipped it. And at the next debate, he had all of Bill Clinton's accusers sitting in the front row um, when he was debating Hillary Clinton. So that he knew that if he was going to get asked a question about misogyny, that he was going to be able to flip it on the Clintons for being equally misogynist. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that's a good point. But it lands, and he was able to diffuse all of that animosity towards himself by simply flipping the idea that the Clintons were absolutely misogynist, and Bill Clinton is a horrible sexual harasser. So he's able to diffuse the whole thing because it lands. It landed with the public, and everybody forgot, just like that, that Trump said, grab him by the pussy. So that's, you know, these are cer certain things that could have been used to take down Joe Biden. Bernie did a decent job, you know, staying on substance, but unfortunately, guys, Substance isn't enough in America. If you go up there and talk only substance without dropping the mic a few times, you will not win. And that's uh, Bernie is evidence of that. He wants to go up there and be, you know, uh, somebody with a heart of gold that only talks substance but never talks any shit. Well, I, you know, I applaud you. Congratulations on your morals. But there's a reason you lost twice. I mean, you also got cheated. But you could have probably um, overcome even the DNC's rigging if you had just had the stones to go after Biden at the last minute. And you didn't have to be mean about it. It could have been framed thusly and you could have gotten the same point across and you probably are president right now. So Bernie's a poor propagandist. Um, hopefully we'll find somebody that can run next that'll do things uh, that is better at framing things and a better debater and isn't afraid to go after um, the people in power that are so obviously old, white, racist, misogynist. Th that stuff lands with people. You know, people nowadays, they care about if you're racist or misogynist or um, corrupt, that stuff does land, uh, particularly the racist, misogynist stuff. Um, you don't believe me, look at the police brutality shit that's going on right now and uh, yeah, all that. So uh, that's a polarizing issue. It always grabs headlines if, if Bernie was able to point out Biden's racism or his misogyny, it would have been game, set, match. So um, it was a good book. I'm giving it four out of five stars. I think it could probably be taught in school. The problem is, is that you need a, a skilled lecturer to actually break it down for people so that, that students don't go into this thinking that it's necessarily a good thing to be a good propagandist because it isn't really. Um, and in fact, the tool of propaganda almost always gets used for poor ends. Um, that being said, you can use it for good ends if you uh, know how to wield it correctly and you don't set your sights on unethical goals, you can absolutely use it. And it's going to exist whether we want it to or not, so might as well try to yield or wield it wherever we can, right guys? So uh, four out of five stars for this, I think I will probably keep it at, at that. I don't think it's going to upgrade. It's not a terribly great read. It's kind of boring. But um, 
it's worth reading at least once. So keep fighting the good fight out there, guys. I'll see ya.